Journeys of Hope, an introduction to the universal church that promotes an attitude of pilgrimage among the faithful by introducing you to pilgrim destinations around the world. Welcome to Journeys of Hope, your spiritual passport to sacred destinations around the world, placing you in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, the Apostles, and the Saints. I'm Angela Cialana, Media Coordinator for Pilgrim Center of Hope. Pilgrim Center of Hope, producer of Journeys of Hope, is a nonprofit ministry founded in 1993. For the last 29 years, Pilgrim Center of Hope has led well over 80 authentic spiritual pilgrimages to various pilgrimage destinations throughout the world, equipping us to lead you on audio spiritual pilgrimages. Journeys of Hope, along with broadcasting over the radio airwaves, is also a podcast available through major podcast apps and on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Our journey today will be a pilgrimage to St. Francis Xavier Cabrini Shrine in New York City. Mother Cabrini was the first American citizen saint and is universal patron saint of immigrants. On today's journey, you will explore the shrine overlooking the Hudson River in northern Manhattan, hear about the life of this American saint, and learn about how she can teach and encourage, inspire us today. Joining us is Julia Attaway, Executive Director of Cabrini Shrine in New York City. Welcome, Julia. Thank you, Angela. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm so thrilled that you were able to join us, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot from you about Mother Cabrini. But first of all, let's kind of talk about the shrine. Um, so you are the executive director there. Uh, who typically visits you at the shrine? <laughs> it's quite a variety of people. We get uh, Catholic tourists who are visiting New York. We get a lot of immigrants who come to pray for uh, their status or for the safe passage of someone who is trying to cross the border or who are uh, having difficulty with their green card. We get families on vacation. We get youth groups. We have pilgrimage groups from parishes, primarily in the Northeast. We get local people popping in to figure out what's going on here. And finally, we get people wandering in after they visited the Cloisters Museum, a branch of the Metropolitan Museum of Art that's a 10 minute walk from here and specializes in medieval religious art. So it makes a kind of nice matchup. Really interesting. That is definitely a variety. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it sounds like there are a lot of people who have uh, a particular personal connection to Mother Cabrini um, and, of course, those who are just curious. So I'm curious about uh, what is your personal connection to Mother Cabrini and why are you, how did you get involved with the shrine? Well, I lived in, on Cabrini Boulevard, which is one of the streets adjacent to, to the shrine, uh, and I raised my five kids down the street. So we came here for Sunday Mass for over 20 years. And for a brief period of time, a couple of years, I was secretary to the board of Mother Cabrini High School, which is also was on the property. Um, it's no longer a high school. And during those hard years of raising teenagers, I often literally had to go to Jesus and would walk down the street and come in. One of the huge benefits in New York City is that most Catholic churches are open during the day. So if you need time to pray or you just want a quiet stopping point, it's worth always testing the door because chances are that it's gonna be open. You know, I just, I loved Mother Cabrini's can-do attitude. Uh, I loved her approach to difficulty. I loved the way that she was a real problem solver and deeply, deeply rooted in Jesus. So uh, I had personal devotion to her, and that has certainly grown since my office is adjacent to where she is right now, and I practically live with her. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I'm sure you've learned a lot from her over the years. But Julia, so let's let's really get into the shrine. Then, as you said, you know, you're very, very close with her. What was Mother Cabrini's connection to the city? Well, New York City was the first place that she served in the U.S. She was born in Italy and was asked to come over uh, in 1889. Uh, so she landed in New York City in 1889. She. I uh, bought the property here. So the shrine is actually located on property that she herself bought. Uh, and it was, she bought the property for a kind of interesting reason. In the prior two years, she had opened two schools and orphanages for the poor in the surrounding region. And uh, she needed to find a way to pay for it. 
So what she did was, this was countryside at the time, and she bought a mansion up here. She turned it into a boarding school for wealthier girls and used the tuition that she got from that to fund the free schools for the poor and the orphanages. So she had a personal connection herself here, and we have a bench here that she used to sit on and pray on, and so that's a very lovely thing to be able to do. Uh, when she died in 1917, she died in Chicago, uh, her body was moved back to New York, not New York City, however. It was moved to West Park, which is up the river about an hour and a half, on the site of a very large orphanage that at one point housed 200 girls. So that was where she always thought she'd be buried. And in fact, she was her body was placed in a mausoleum there. And then when her cause for canonization started to look very probable, the cause was opened, the waiting period at the time was 50 years. And uh, she died in 1917. And the case was opened, the period was waived, the waiting period was waived because of popular acclaim. And uh, it started in 1922. So that was five years. Yeah. Uh, and then by 1928, it, when everything was really looking good, uh, they, the building that was on this property was raised and a high school was, ra was built there which is, the building is still standing. And then in 1933, her body was translated, her remains were translated down here. She was then beatified in 1938. So she was originally under, the, her second stay, shall we say, was under the altar in the high school chapel. Mm -hmm. And then following her canonization in 1946, uh, it was a big deal because it was the first American citizen who was a saint. It was the first canonization after World War II. Uh, the number of people who came to visit her remains on day one was 45,000. Wow. So 45,000 people came through the school and uh, continued to come, not quite in that quantity daily, but certainly in the thousands per week. And it became a big deal to have to navigate running a school and having all these visitors. So when the building on the adjacent property burned in 1950, the decision was made to make a separate shrine. And then when that was completed in 1959, her remains were translated here. So wow. it's a kind of complicated story, but, you know, she liked to move around in life. It was, <laughs> <laughs> she uh, got to move around a little bit in death as well. So the shrine, um, that thank you for that history. That was really fascinating. The shrine now has her remains, um, but there's also a lot more to see and experience. You mentioned that bench that she used to sit on. Can you kind of help us paint this picture for pilgrims who are interested um, in possibly coming to visit? What What's a brief kind of overview of what you all have there at the shrine? The most important thing that we have here is her. <laughs> that, that is the reason to come. Uh, we have a there's a mosaic on the wall in the front of the chapel that is made out of lovely Italian marble and stone and that depicts various scenes from her life so that it creates a kind of uh, visual narrative of what she did. And the we have a small museum which consists of a variety of different kinds of things that rotate over time. We try and keep the exhibit moving so that there are different aspects of her life that are drawn out. Right now we have an exhibit on a day in her life. So taking uh, artifacts and taking quotes and taking little vignettes of her life and constructing them. So what did she do when she woke up and what happened in the morning and what happened in the afternoon and how what happened at night? and looking at those kinds of things. So that you get a real sense of who she was and how her day went. Uh, we have artifacts of her, so we have a habit of hers, a full, you know, full habit, uh, which she was only five feet tall. Mm. So it's really <laughs> kind of cute. <laughs> we have a pair of her shoes that are worn out from running around in the streets because she was an active lady. Uh, we have 
documents that she signed because she was a tremendous businesswoman. And you know, people don't think of saints as business people, but this is a woman who was signing contracts at the turn of the 20th century and reviewing them herself. So she's really quite a powerhouse in many different ways. We also have a separate exhibit that's in the back on uh, relics, on, sa on sacred relics, because a lot of people don't know very much about relics. It's not something that's part of what we learn, and certainly in CCD, or you know, people just don't talk about it. So what is a relic, and why do Catholics do that? Uh, it's taking it out of that sort of, hmm, that must be a superstitious thing, into a real experience of drawing close to our heroes, to the saints, and how that came about. And then there's also one of the more unusual second-class relics, probably, that you'll ever see, which is at the back of the chapel, a carriage that she herself drove. So it's because it was, that is a second-class relic, she used it, and, but there's an actual horse-drawn carriage, and there's always a four-year-old who wants to know, where's the horse? But uh, it, we don't have a horse here. So <laughs> at the back of the chapel, there is also a three-story stained glass window of her uh, that is pretty dramatic, that looks out over the Hudson River. And the for the longest time, I couldn't figure out why they had the, that mural, that stained glass there, because the choir loft kind of cuts her off. And then I read the notes from the architect, and the idea was that she would be looking out over the world, so it was to be seen from the outside. So at night, we always leave the lights on so that you, mm. you can see it from the street. Uh, and now the locals like to park their cars there because they figure it'll be safe. <laughs> wow. That's so so we, also, we also have a, a gift shop that has a lot of uh, you know books about Mother Cabrini, has rosaries that have second-class relics built inside the, the metal, um, various statues and other kinds of things that people like to have. Awesome. Well, it really sounds like you kind of have the total package um, as far as, you know, a pilgrimage destination and just so much to learn and see. Um, so let's kind of dive into sort of a spiritual pilgrimage of coming to the shrine. Um, how do people usually arrive at the shrine and is there parking kind of how do you get to the shrine and what what do we see when we're there? Well, it's New York City. So driving is not usually something that visitors want to do. Uh, we do have some, a limited amount of parking, but most people arrive by mass transit. We're right across the street from the A train subway stop. So it's very easy, and the A is an express train from Midtown, so it's very easy to get here. Uh, it's a very safe neighborhood. People come up out of the uh, out of the subway. You have to take an elevator up. There are two exits, so you take the elevator up. You come out. You can see this the shrine to your left across the street. It's very very easy to find. And um, I was looking at some pictures there. It looks like there's kind of a wall around and yes. a lot of brick. Um, can you so say it's anything behind, about that? Yeah, it's, that's the original wall from the mansion that was here that she bought. So wow. it's it's still behind a stone wall. So it's a very it's very private in that sense. Uh, it doesn't have a really urban feel. Maybe if you're from the country, it does, but <laughs> it's not at all like being in Midtown or downtown. It's a very residential area, so it's quiet. How many, uh, I guess, since I'm thinking about New York, I'm thinking about, you know, multi-level buildings. So, like, how big of a building are we talking about? Oh, it's, you know, the chapel itself seats 375, so it's not huge. Uh, it's, and it's probably, well, it's three stories tall at least, uh, but not not massive. It was built in 1959, so it's classic mid-century architecture. Okay. Um, so, you know, we kind of talked about um, the, there's the chapel is sort of the highlight of the shrine. Is there anything that we kind of see in between kind of getting from the street to the chapel? Can you walk us through there? Sure. So you come in through the gates, through the the stone in the gate in the stone wall, 
and you come over and up the steps to the front porch and there are angels on the doors which are the original from the original doors uh, and come in and there's a beautiful statue of mother cabrini there uh, and that is actually the gift shop at this point uh, you come up and around the hall around the bend and then the museum is straight in front of you and to the right you turn around and there she is one of the things that is unusual about the way in which uh, she her body is kept here is that it's within a glass reliquary underneath the altar which is shaped like a coffin and it, many times it's it's actually quite engaging especially for kids and teens because they come in and, and the first thought is what <laughs> and, and so it it creates an opportunity for discussion. Why do we do that? What is it? What's happening there? Her body is not incorrupt. Her body was found to be subject to the normal process of decay when she was exhumed prior to her beatification. However, the face, so the face and the hands that you see, because it's dressed like she was, uh, the face and the hands are made of wax. And that's actually an incredibly powerful thing once you sit with it, because it's very important that we don't see our saints as made of stone, that we don't see our saints only in paintings or know them only in stories. When we see someone as they looked in life, knowing that they are in heaven with Jesus, it's an incredible connection because suddenly you can relate to the saint as a person mm -hmm. in a very like, three-dimensional way. So you can draw close physically and spiritually, and it creates a trust because you can see, you can see. So that's a very powerful thing for many, many people. Uh, there are not many saints in the US who are buried that way. I only know of St. John Newman in Philadelphia. Uh, in, it's more common in Europe, obviously, but here it's very uncommon. Right. Um, and I, just thank you for that, because I was just, you know, almost getting emotional just thinking about how um, how beautiful it is that we have the saints and to really kind of learn about how close they can be with us, that they can be our friends, that they can be our supporters as well. Um, now you you spoke about the chapel with the different scenes of mother cabrini's life and in our next segment i want to kind of talk about what some of those scenes would be and about more of her life is there anything else in the chapel that kind of stands out when people come and visit that's the most powerful that's the most powerful as it should be uh, interestingly when you if you stand directly in front of the altar uh, you see mother cabrini and directly behind her is a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And directly above the statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus is a mosaic of the Blessed Sacrament. And that sort of tells the whole story because you can't look at her without seeing Jesus and Jesus is present to us in the sacrament. So there's this connection there. There's a Eucharistic connection. There's a connection to the love of Jesus and it all works as a piece. Beautiful. Um, now we kind of passed through uh, a little quickly and we had the, the gift shop at the very uh, front of the, the shrine. Um, you mentioned a few things there, the museum as well. Uh, is there um, maybe something that, uh, maybe one or two items more that you could discuss uh, that, maybe you don't have in the museum now, but that may be coming in the future or that you've had in the past in the exhibits there? Sure. We have some, we have various artifacts that we don't always have out. For example, we have a bed at first and we have some of the furniture. Uh, we have a lot of, of articles of clothing uh, and we know that they're hers because they all have her laundry mark on them which is kind of fun, you know, back in the day when everybody wore the same clothes as a, a sister and it went to the laundry room and you had to figure out whose was whose when it came back. And before, before the days of Sharpies and labels, <laughs> and you had to figure out a way to, to identify it. So they would embroider 
a little symbol on each each article of clothing. And for the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, it was a little sacred heart and then a number, and hers was number one. So not that she thought she was number one, but that's the one they gave her. And so we, ha we can always tell what's hers by the little laundry mark that's on there. So we have a lot of articles of clothing. And in fact, uh, one of the reasons we have a lot of articles of clothing, or so the sisters tell me, is because they knew she was a saint while she was alive. So every time she put something in the laundry, they would whisk it away and make up a new one. <laughs> so they <laughs> made brighter to do it so that everybody got something. That's so cool. Um, now, just real briefly, um, the tours. I mean, do you offer tours there or is it just kind of, uh, you know, lead yourself through? I, we love to offer tours. We love to offer tours. And if you plan on coming, you call ahead and ask to have somebody talk to you because tours are much more engaging. You get a chance to ask the questions that are really burning in your mind. And you get to talk to somebody who loves Mother Cabrini and can speak with her heart. Okay, so what do, what what might we, I mean, is it basically what you're kind of walking us through now as far as what we would experience on a tour? Yes and no. Uh, we talk a lot about her life and her spirituality, uh, and we try and tailor it specifically to whoever we're talking to. So it's not just, because otherwise we could just record it, right? That would be fine. But for example, I, when we have youth in who come from troubled backgrounds, we talk, we veer things in that direction because, uh, or teenagers, because how she approached difficulty is really important. A lot of times we think difficulty is a problem and that's not how she viewed it at all. And to help kids get unstuck and moving another way, we can frame some of her experiences in that way. Or if we're talking to young women or women considering a vocation, we'll talk more about why, how she could be so feminine and so strong at the same time. So if we're talking to families, we talk very gently, right? We, we talk with, with kids differently than we're gonna to talk to a group of people of Italian heritage who are coming because they have a, a long devotion to Mother Cabrini. So that's really where that comes in. Uh, the other thing that happens, we have the ability on request to bring out a first class relic for pilgrims to venerate personally. Wow, what a special, special opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, and since you mentioned that, I'm wondering also, you know, when we go on a pilgrimage, it's a journey of faith. So um, what about the sacraments? Do you have the sacraments available? We have mass every day we're open. We have adoration every day that we're open. Uh, the, we don't have a priest on site full time, so we don't hear confessions regularly. If you came as a group with a priest, of course, as long as we have the appropriate uh, letter of uh, you know, saying that it's okay, uh, the, a priest can offer a private mass or offer confessions. That's fine too. Great. That's great to know. Um, and, you know, are there any other little opportunities that we should know about or that people kind of enjoy when, when visiting? I think that those people enjoy talking. You know, people enjoy telling their stories and we're a relatively small shrine. You know, some of these shrines have thousands of pilgrims coming through all the time and we're relatively small. And it's lovely to have that personal station. And we really like to do that. Is there any kind of entry fee to to come in or um, are y'all, I, I assume you're you're supported by donations? We are supported by donations. We don't ask a specific entry fee. Groups, we ask that a contribution of $5 a person, if you're asking for a talk, a, a talk for the group. Uh, but otherwise, no, we don't. It's all donation. It's awesome that y'all are, um, you're sort of living kind of like Mother Cabrini did in in that regard. And um, that you're, you're also kind of, 
uh, fulfilling something that she did while she was here on earth, you know, having that bridge between people and God and the communion of saints and, and helping people to kind of, to learn more. Uh, is there lesson or, or hope that um, you see people walk away with after their visit? I think that what happens here is primarily between the individual heart and Mother Cabrini and the heart of Jesus. And if you come in with an open heart, your heart will be changed for the better by the time you've left. It's powerful. We hear stories all the time. Every time we have a new worker in the gift shop, the first month is always, I can't believe all the things that happen here. I can't believe <laughs> these stories. Because it's it really is a constant stream of stories of healing and stories of hope and stories of comfort. Uh, and we hear it all the time. And I think that that's really why people come on pilgrimage. You know, you, you want your heart to change. You want your heart to grow. And one of my favorite quotes of Mother Cabrini, well, when people come on pilgrimage, we do two things. We ask everyone who comes to spend a few minutes in prayer for refugees and migrants around the world, because they should. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing that we do is we give them what we call our pilgrimage card, which has 10 very short prayers of Mother Cabrini's on the back. And we ask them to read through those prayers and pray them with her and find the one that resonates for them. Awesome. So that they can make her prayer their prayer. And my favorite is the last on that one, which is Jesus, carve your heart in mind. Beautiful. Well, friends, you're listening to Journeys of Hope. I'm Angela Cialana here with Julia Attaway of the Shrine of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini in New York City. After this break, we'll continue our journey to learn more from this beautiful American saint. You're on the everyday journey of life, and sometimes it's tough to keep hope alive. Well, that's why Pilgrim Center of Hope is here for you. Not only does Pilgrim Center of Hope provide you programs like Journeys of Hope, but did you know you can also find other helpful media productions from Pilgrim Center of Hope on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Every first Friday, take an audio retreat with Jesus called Meet the Master. Every third Thursday, have a social with the saints. And our new quarterly series, Who is the Man of the Shroud, meets at the intersection of faith, true crime, science and medicine, history, art, and much more. Find it all at pilgrimcenterofhope.org or on your favorite podcast app. And keep hope alive in your daily journey. Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Hello, this is Jason Nunez and Angela Cialana, both from the media department at Pilgrim Center of Hope, who produce Journeys of Hope. Would you like to honor someone special in your life and support the production of this unique weekly series? We are in need of monthly sponsors for upcoming Journeys of Hope programs to help cover some of the production costs by a donation. If you've sponsored a month of Journeys of Hope in the past, we thank you for your support. Pilgrim Center of Hope has a donation wish list, and on it, several months of upcoming Journeys of Hope programming are still needing sponsors. If you're interested, please consider selecting a month that you wish to sponsor by going to pilgrimcenterofhope.org and under the Give menu, select Wish List. You can also choose to dedicate your donation in honor or in memory of someone special. Thank you for joining us in our mission. Now, enjoy the rest of your journey. Welcome back to Journeys of Hope. Our journey today is a spiritual pilgrimage to the Shrine of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini in New York City. And joining us on the way is its Executive Director, Julia Attaway. Julia, thanks again for joining us. Glad to be here. Well, let's go ahead and really give a formal introduction of Mother Cabrini. We've been kind of talking a little bit, giving some hints here and there. Who was she and what was her spirituality? Well, Mother Cabrini was born in Northern Italy in 1850, which can seem like a long time ago to a lot of people today. However, we actually have photographs of her. 
we know what she looked like. We know we have things that we can see and touch. And that makes her more present in many ways than someone who lived centuries and centuries ago. She was born in 1850 to a large family in Northern Italy, farming family. And they were very devout. She knew from a very young age that she was called to be religious. And she specifically was called to be a missionary. And we're all called to be missionaries. But you know, she had that, she didn't have the fear of being a missionary the way some of us sometimes do. Uh, so she also had a very difficult childhood in the sense that she, first she was born two months prematurely. So she was sick a lot. I mean, if two months premature today is still a lot, uh, in 1850, it's a miracle that she even lived. And by the time she was 10, four of her siblings had died. So she knew a lot of sorrow. She knew a lot of loss. Uh, she knew a lot of grief. She was, had bronchial trouble. She survived tuberculosis as a child. Her parents both died when she was 20. The following year, smallpox hit the town. She went out with her sister to nurse people and, of course, got it. Uh, but did survive. Uh, so she knew a lot of su about suffering. And yet she also knew the love of God from a very young age. And when she was tiny, was like seven, she would go and to her uncle's house in a nearby village and make little paper boats and fill them with violets, which she called her missionaries. And she would put the boats in the water and they would float off so they could go to China. Because she always believed she was going to go to China. And when she was around nine, she fell in. And she almost drowned. And that was a very powerful experience because it left her with a visceral fear of water. And we all have deep fears. We all have things that we're really, really afraid of whether we admit it or not. <laughs> and so this is a saint who understands fear. She understands problems. And she, as an adult, would not get into a boat for any reason other than to serve Jesus. Because, of course, in the late 1800s, the only way to get to a mission country was across an ocean. So she understood that Jesus could call you to the other side of your fears, that sometimes serving him requires passing through your fears. And much of her life, as an adult, she developed malaria, she had hemorrhages, she had all kinds of physical problems. This is a woman who ended up crossing the ocean 23 times. Wow. She did not rest, in fact, she would say, Tell the sisters, you know, work, work, because you have all eternity to rest. <laughs> she was really quite a powerhouse. She was, so she, she grew up, she wanted to become a, a sister and knew she was called to become a sister. But when she graduated from her high school uh, with this teaching certificate, uh, she was re rejected by the order that had taught her because she was too sickly. So she applied to a second order and was rejected there and applied to a third order and was rejected there. So this is a saint who understands disappointment. She was finally, as she taught for a while in a village school where the local priest noted that she was extremely competent and also very gentle, that she persuaded the children with gentleness and kindness she was not harsh. She did not use corporal punishment. She did not use threats. And in fact, her educational philosophy, which she developed as she went on and founded schools, started with the understanding that you should never shame a child. That children need to know that they're loved in order to grow and thrive. And so there was a, an incredible gentleness about her, but also this, this fierce faith that was never in anyone's face. So she was asked, the priest 
spoke about her to the local bishop who asked her to come and be the administrator in an orphanage in a nearby town because she's very efficient and very competent. And she went, and within a month, it was a, a religious order, and within a month had taken the veil and took the name Xavier because of St. Francis Xavier, who was a great missionary to the Far East, because that was still her dream, even though this was a diocesan order. And it was a horrible, horrible place. <laughs> There's no way around it that her superior really didn't have a vocation and was cruel. So this is a saint who understands bullying. This is a saint who is tormented. And what did she do in that situation? A lot of us would simply say, oh, must have made a mistake, get me out of here. Uh, and which is not a wrong thing to, to wonder, but what she did in that situation was to dive deeper into the love of Jesus. What she did was learn to turn to him for all her consolation and all her hope and all her care. And so the six years that she was there really formed her through difficulty. And in fact, later, when they would start missions in different places, she and the sisters, she would, they often encountered huge obstacles. And her perspective on that was, if there's a cross in the road, we know Jesus is with us. So again, it, the way that she looked at things, the way that she looked at problems, the way that she looked at difficulty was not as something that was an obstacle to faith or an obstacle to loving Jesus, but merely the circumstances in which she was asked to love and serve God. Hmm. So after six years uh, of being in that order, they the local bishop said enough and closed the order and asked her to form her own order. And that was when she began the Missionary Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which was originally a diocesan order and then later became a pontifical rite order. And primarily they were active in Northern Italy, running schools and orphanages. And then she was approached by Bishop Scalabrini, who was just canonized a couple of weeks ago yeah. and about the possibility of coming to the United States, which of course is in the opposite direction from China. <laughs> and the, the problem was that many, 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 like a million Italians had emigrated to the United States in hope of a better life. But for a variety of reasons, some of which had to do with race, some of which had to do uh, with the their low educational level, lots of people didn't get past third or fourth grade. They were peasants, they had no skill sets. Uh, they were treated abysmally. The housing conditions were terrible. The health conditions were terrible. I read a statistic recently that said that one in five Italian men in New York City uh, in the 19th century either died or was maimed on the job. Wow. So it was incredibly dangerous, worst possible. They're at the bottom of the immigrant pecking order. And there were very few Italian priests in the US, United States at the time. So there was a great need for uh, someone to work with these Italians and to help the families and to catechize and to help them retain their faith. Because again, it, our faith is not when we're in the middle of difficulty, we can't abandon our faith because we don't have time or because we're too preoccupied or any of that's when we need faith the most. Mm -hmm. So she was asked to come to the US and she thought about it and prayed about it and consulted with various people and finally went to Pope Leo the 13th and said, ask his advice. And he said famously, not to the East, but to the West. So he gave her that instruction and she followed it, which meant going the exact opposite way of where she thought she was going to go. Mm. So that year that she agreed to come, a doctor had told her that she probably had about two years to live. 
Wow. So I don't know about you, but if somebody told me I had two years to live, I probably wouldn't get on a boat when I was in the <laughs> water and go to a country where I didn't speak the language to work with people in dire poverty. And she saw exactly the opposite. So she, what she saw was that if you only have two years left in your life, what better thing to do? What else could you possibly want than to serve God with all your heart and all your being and to go down serving him? So she came. She came. And so she first arrived in New York at the end of March in 1889 and uh, worked in the slums, went out among, in a really dangerous alleyways, collected children to start catechism classes. In one week, she arrived with six sisters. In one week, had more than 300 kids signed up for catechism. So the need was definitely there, <laughs> and she met it. But of course, once you have kids, you have orphans, or you have kids that need help. She, within a month, she had an orphanage up and running. Uh, then you have to have schools, and then you have to take care of people, and it just grew and grew and grew. So. But that was here in New York. She was also called then to Nicaragua because there is an Italian uh, enclave there. She went to New Orleans. There's an Italian enclave there. She went to Philadelphia and Newark and Scranton, Pennsylvania, where there were miners. She went to Chicago. She went to Denver. She went to Los Angeles and Seattle. She went to Panama. She went to Argentina. I mean, she, this is a woman who crossed the Andes on a mule. This is she's fierce. And she's in Brazil. She was in Paris. She was in London. She was in Spain. So she definitely traveled a lot. Wow. And in all cases, she was, you know, her, her quest was not so much, oh, let me go do immigrants as a cause, but there are people here whose hearts need God and whose lives need help. So where, where does the, um, the, the sacred heart devotion come into all this? Is that from her early childhood or is that something that she kind of developed over time? Well, I mean, this was the, the golden age of the sacred, sacred heart and the five wounds. Uh, so it was very common, a very common devotion at the time. She was tremendously devoted to the heart of Jesus. And almost every single school that she founded was called Sacred Heart Something or every orphanage Sacred Heart Something, uh, because that was what that was the reason for her existence. Uh, she wanted to draw people closer to Jesus, and that was why she would go across an ocean. You don't go across an ocean just so that you can feed somebody. I mean, maybe you do, but not if you're a saint. Or you're, uh, you, you need to know God, because she understood that real healing and real hope can't exist without the love of Jesus, without knowledge of the love of Jesus. I referred before to her educational philosophy. And one of the things she called it education of the heart. And she believed that you could not be an educated person, a truly educated person, if you did not know God, because he is the source of all knowledge. He's the source of all wisdom and strength. So um, Mother Cabrini, she founded all these schools and um, helped so many children. Um, was that pretty much her, her main work when she was here on earth? She did, she worked, she did schools and hospitals and orphanages. She was, uh, became involved in hospital work, partly as an outcropping. Of course, this was a time when the whole country, especially in New York, was divided on ethnic lines. So if you look at the names of the various hospitals in New York City, they all have, you know, there was one that was clearly a German hospital and there's one that was clearly a, you know, from different backgrounds, a Jewish hospital or, or things like that. Uh, of course, you do need to actually have a doctor who can speak your language if you want any kind of decent care. And you need the comfort of your own food 
and of being able to talk to people. So she was not interested particularly in, she was asked to take on a hospital which was loaded with debts and she was not interested in taking on someone else's debts. And then two things happened that changed her mind. One was that there, one of the sisters had gone to visit a man in the hospital who was dying and he had a letter which he'd not been able to read for nine months because he didn't read and hadn't found anybody who knew how to read. And so the sister read the letter to him and in it, he learned that his mother had died. Mm. And that was a, the need to have people of your own country who can help in that situation was very apparent. The other thing that happened was that Mother Cabrini had a dream and in the dream, she saw Our Lady working in a hospital. And she said, oh, Blessed Mother, why are you doing that? And Mary turned to her and said, because you're not. I guess that would definitely get me off my feet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so she had hospitals. Uh, and was involved in healthcare because, as part of that, you know, today we use the word holistic, which is yeah, it's kind of a trendy term, but she really did think about all of the needs of someone. It's very hard to talk to someone about God when their stomach is rumbling so loudly that they can't hear, or it's very hard to um, speak about love when someone is writhing in pain. And so, all of these things work together. It's not, for her, it was not an either or, but she's a woman of deep, deep, deep prayer. And this exhibit that we have right now, it, if you add up the number of hours that she were blocked out for her prayer, it was like four hours a day. And it was a lot of time. And so that, that was the fuel. That was the fuel for all the activity. But in the course of her lifetime around the world, she founded 67 schools, hospitals, orphanages. So it's a lot. Uh, she, she wouldn't think it was a lot because she wasn't thinking about uh, what she did, but about the hearts of the people that she was touching. What um, happened to her at the end of her life? I mean, she seemed like a real fighter at the beginning of her life and, and throughout. Um, could you tell us about how she passed away? Sure. Uh, she had heart problems, especially after she had malaria. Uh, and was coming back, had come back from a business trip and got to Chicago. And then uh, had a heart, it was a heart attack. She died of um Chronic endocarditis it was the actual uh, actual description, uh, but it was sudden. It wasn't a surprise. She was 67 years old, so she died then. Um, and as far as I mean, she was she was a patron saint of immigrants. Um, the shrine today, obviously, you said at the beginning of our program that that there are immigrants uh, that come and and pray and ask our intercession. What other ways uh, is the shrine involved in that and, and reflects that patronage? A number of ways. Uh, we have the missionary sisters have a sponsored ministry called Cabrini Immigrant Services, which is lo now located adjacent to the shrine on the same property. And they provide legal consultations and social service consultations to people. It's a Department of Justice uh, accredited agency and they've been around for more than 20 years. We have in this latest wave of immigrants, the New York City has recently had a lot of immigrants bust in from the border. And so uh, one thing that the shrine did almost immediately, because when I talk to people, it's, it, these are our new neighbors. This is an opportunity for us to grow an understanding of what it means to be a neighbor, not just on a give a tube of toothpaste, level, which is important as a start, but on a sustained level. How do we approach that? How do we help people? And so we've done a lot of outreach to the local community, which has come through in amazing abundance. Uh, secular neighbors, people who had never been into the shrine before, coming in with coats, because many of these people are arriving with just t-shirts, and it's cold here. 
So uh, that kind of responsiveness, doing educational programs on immigration issues, doing things really to try, working more and more toward trying to do things that integrate different communities. Uh, we have Spanish masses, we have English masses, and you know, trying to find ways so that the faith is Catholic, it is rich and it's for everyone. Uh, that we very much welcome uh, immigrant groups from other ethnicities, from others. So looking at having an, a group of people from Nigeria or people from Vietnamese background, or we had a group of Chinese and pe speaking people in here uh, not very long ago. And that's just tremendously rich. So uh, for Mother Cabrini's feast day, for example, which is coming up in November. We, the Shrine offers masses, five masses over two days. And the, one in Italian, one for the Filipino community, one in French for French speaking Africans and people from Haiti, uh, one in English and one in Spanish. So that's a lot of languages in two days, but I'd, I would love to be able to expand it to be even richer. That's awesome. And it really sounds like uh, if one were to participate there at the shrine, um, it would be kind of like a little taste of heaven there. Just have so many different <laughs> people coming in and out. Um, I, I would imagine, uh, Julia, that you've you've learned a lot uh, from Mother Cabrini and from being the executive director of this shrine. Um, if you could kind of pinpoint uh, one of the lessons or highlight one of the lessons that you've mentioned throughout so beautifully that Mother Cabrini can teach us today, what would you say that that an important lesson is for us? That the reason that we sometimes don't talk about our faith, the reason that we're afraid to evangelize and afraid to be the missionaries we're called to be is because we don't love enough and that our hearts have to grow bigger and our love of God has to grow deeper and that we have to empty ourselves of everything that prevents his grace from pouring into us. That's beautiful. I, you know, when I think about Mother Cabrini, as you shared, um, she, she definitely had no lack of love, it seems like. I mean, uh, even, you know, going through all the suffering that she went through, a lot of times that can really embitter us. And it seems like um, she just was open to God's grace in such a way that um, she allowed those things to really um, kind of refine her. Uh, you know, our country, the U.S., is, is going through a lot right now. I mean, it the sure whole world is. is. <laughs> <laughs> and, sure. you know, she just really strikes me as someone who, who can teach us um, a lot and help us through these difficult times. I absolutely believe that. She's not distant. I mean, her experiences are absolutely relevant to ours. She knew how not only to get through them, but how to get through them and grow in faith at the same time. And, and the fact that she continuously pointed to Jesus and still does to this day. Yes. Um, and and to uh, the beauty of, you know, the Sacred Heart devotion is it comes back to Jesus. It comes back to the Eucharist. And so I, I'm i just so grateful that we were able to, to learn so much about Mother Cabrini. You know, on Journeys of Hope, we have this jewel for the journey tradition where we give our listeners a jewel, a spiritual gem that they can reflect on. The words of Mother Cabrini that I picked for today are this. Each time that I encounter sufferings, I pour out my soul to Jesus and I am consoled and comforted. Go to Jesus. Talk to him. Pour it out. Let him fill you up. Yeah. Um, and that really is one of the, the greatest lessons that we can have on, on a pilgrimage that no matter what happens in our life, no matter what season we are in our life, that uh, our faith is, is always going to point us in the right direction. It's going to refresh us, you know, those, those opportunities to go to Jesus um, on pilgrimage, no matter where we are. Uh, but particularly if we go to the Cabrini Shrine in New York, um, <laughs> 
those are going to be ways that we can be refreshed and and go forward in our life and our, our daily pilgrimage. Um, Julia, thank you so much for joining us on Journeys of Hope. I'd like for you to kind of share with people if they want to get in contact with you, learn more about the shrine, how they can do that. We, you can look at our website, which is cabrinishrinenyc.org, or you can call us if you want to uh, set up a time to come on pilgrimage with a guided tour, and our phone number is 212-923-3536. Awesome. Thank you. And we will have all that information on our website as well. Fellow Pilgrims, we invite you to come visit Pilgrim Center of Hope if you're close to us and learn more about our threefold ministry of pilgrimages, conferences, and media production outreach. We are a nonprofit ministry as well. We welcome your donations. Every bit helps. Join us in this vital mission of evangelization as we guide people to Christ and the church. And you can visit our website to get connected with the Cabrini Shrine as well. Learn more about where they are and a little sneak peek uh, of the shrine pilgrimcenterofhope.org. You can call us also at 210-521-3377. Hello, pilgrims. Let's strive to live each day with love, faith, courage, and hope like Mother Cabrini. Until next time, may God bless you and safe travels. of Hope, a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit our website at pilgrimcenterofhope.org.